Uh, reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdom of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authorities and splendor it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Imagine if I gave each of you a marshmallow and set you a challenge. I can't do this because of COVID and etc. But imagine if I gave each of you a marshmallow at the beginning of this sermon and I set you this challenge. If you can hold on to this marshmallow throughout the sermon without eating it, then at the end you can eat that marshmallow and another marshmallow, an additional one. Do you think you'd be able to manage to wait for the two at the end? Or would you eat the one during? What do you think? One. The one? <laughs> two? Two? Perhaps it, I'd hope that you'd be able to wait for the two, but perhaps it would matter whether I can hold your attention with the sermon, perhaps, perhaps not. There was this Stanford psychological study in 1972, a famous study where researchers, they tried exactly this, but there's one key difference they tried this on four and five-year-olds. And in, in that experiment, they would also leave a child on their own in a room. It's quite sad, really, if you think about it. They'd leave this child on their own in a room with one marshmallow and, uh, and, and say exactly that. If you can wait for 15 minutes, you'll get two at the end. And the result was, do you want to hear the results? Two out of three of the kids ate the marshmallow. Only one out of three managed to get to, at the end, resist temptation. And this study has been replicated all over the world, lots of different cultures, just to check that it kind of carries over. And uh, I love the Colombian version of the, the study, because one little girl in the Colombian version of the study, she ate the inside of the marshmallow, but not the outside. <laughs> In, in an attempt to trick the researchers into giving her, I just love that. That's brilliant. But of course, she was filmed for the study, so it didn't quite didn't quite work out. And I also liked when reading about these different studies and different cultures. I liked hearing about how the the children resisted temptation. Some made up quiet songs and sang them to themselves. That's so cute, isn't it? Some hid their head in their arms, so it was like, you know, trying to get the marshmallow to disappear. Some prayed to the ceiling, and one little girl, she rested her head, relaxed her body, and fell off to sleep. <laughs> I love that. Resisting temptation by going to sleep. So you might have guessed from our reading and that intro that this morning we're thinking about temptation. What is temptation? Consider that question for a moment. Let's not pounce on answers to this, but consider, are there different kinds? 
Well, there's temptation. Perhaps some ideas or situations might come to mind for you. That's all good. We've all got experience that we can bring to bear on this question. And I don't want to say that one idea about temptation trumps another. If anything, let's widen this out. Let's broaden this conversation. I suppose the first kind of, question, kind of temptation that might have come to mind for you would be the classic the temptation to do the wrong thing. Did that come to mind for you when I said temptation? Don't eat the marshmallow. Don't do that. Don't do this. But what if I want to? What if I can get away with it? The classic example of this, from scripture anyway, is of David, king of Israel. And one day he is walking on the roof of his home and he sees a woman called Bathsheba washing. And he finds out that she is married, but he still asks for her to be brought to him and she conceives. He tries to cover it up, uh, but ends up having to get rid of her husband Uriah so that he can marry her. And it was messy at the end. He was tempted to do the wrong thing multiple times and gave in again and again and again. There's a question here, how do we discern what is wrong? And of course, that's a question for another sermon on another day, but perhaps enough for us right now is whatever is the opposite of Christ-like love. That I think is a, is a definition that can help us because sometimes we've been told that things are wrong that aren't and sometimes things are okay that are actually wrong. <laughs> but how about whatever is opposite of Christ-like love? So the temptation to do the wrong thing But is there another kind of temptation? How about this? The temptation to not do the right thing. What's that about? We find an illustration of this kind of temptation in a Jesus story. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. Some of you will be familiar with it. And Jesus tells a story about a man who was attacked by robbers and... um, They took all his stuff, left him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down that road and saw the half dead man and crossed to the other side. So did a Levite. A Levite did the exact same, crossed over to the other side. They succumbed to the temptation to not do the right thing. So we have two types of temptation here. The temptation to do the wrong thing and the temptation to not do the right thing. And I have a hunch that more conservative churches will tend to focus on resisting the temptation to do the wrong thing, and more progressive churches will tend to focus on the temptation to not do the right thing. But perhaps there are other forms of temptation too. What about this? The temptation to become numb to right and wrong altogether. Some people have become numb to right and wrong. An extreme example of this is Otto Adolf Eichmann, who during the Holocaust arranged the transportation of hundreds of thousands of Jewish people to concentration camps. After the war, long after the war, he was put on trial and he showed no remorse Because he believed he was simply doing his job, doing what was expected of him. And doing what he did best, logistics and arranging transport. And I know that's a really extreme example. But aren't we all tempted to become numb to right and wrong? Rather than asking, is it right? How much easier is it to ask, is this what's expected of me in this context? Does it work for me? Will it help me put another foot on a rung of the ladder? So you have the temptation to do the wrong thing, temptation to not do the right thing, and the temptation to become none, none to right and wrong altogether. I wonder which of those stands out to you, which of those you've had the most experience with in your life. Here's one more. There might be more than four, but this fourth kind is the last I can think of. And it's the temptation to pursue the right thing in the wrong way. 
the right thing in the wrong way. And we're going to need Jesus' help to understand this, let alone escape this. So we're going to focus in on that story that we heard read. After his baptism, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and was tempted or tested by the devil. And the word devil means accuser or slanderer. We need not necessarily believe in a supernatural being for this story to make sense because you know what it's like to have those devilish thoughts, those thoughts that lead you away from the truth, that you are loved and sustained at every moment by a good God. Anything that takes you away from that is a devilish thought. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, he was tempted to pursue the right thing, but in the wrong way. Jesus was hungry. Very, very hungry. And hunger can change a person, can't it? Have you ever been hangry? You know what that's like? When hunger and anger come together and you're hangry, your hunger makes you irritable. I know some of you know what that's like. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Alfred Henry Lewis said there are only nine meals between mankind and anarchy. Only nine missed meals before chaos. And Jesus was hungry. And this devilish voice says to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus was fully human, had the same hunger that we have. He would need to eat at some point or he would die. Meeting the needs of an empty stomach was the right thing by his body. But to command a stone to become bread was the wrong way of pursuing the right thing. Jesus' miracles, think about the Gospels, Jesus' miracles were never for his own benefit. If he started using miracles in that way, then what would stop him working a miracle every time he got into a scrape? Or even perhaps rescuing himself from the cross? Imagine if he was that kind of Jesus, the kind of Jesus that rescues himself from the cross when people start taunting him and saying, save yourself. That's not Jesus. But he was tempted to do the right thing in the wrong way. Jesus' second temptation is similar. He has led up to a high place, and showing all the kingdoms of the world, the devilish voice says, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Again, Jesus is tempted to pursue the right thing in the wrong way. He's tempted to become the ultimate authority on earth, to be called Lord in every nation. Surely, that does something befitting the Son of God, right? To be called Lord in every nation. There are people today in every nation who call Jesus Lord. What a wonderful thing that is. But he's tempted to pursue that very thing in the wrong way by gaining authority through the worship of something or someone that is not God. Pursuing authority through idolatry. And finally, Jesus' third temptation. Jesus is taken to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem and told this, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. That's a quote from Psalm 91. Of course, Jesus wants to be the kind of person that will trust in God's providence and protection, but he is tempted to pursue just that, in the wrong way. He's tempted to purposefully put himself in danger to test out God's emergency response times. So to summarise, Jesus is tempted to pursue the right things, food for his stomach, authority over all, and trust in God. He's tempted to pursue the right things in the wrong way by using miracles for his own benefit, gaining authority through idolatry, and putting God to the test through risky behaviour. But Jesus doesn't give in because he knows that God is enough for him in the wilderness. 
He has his needs and he believes God will meet them. So that's how you do. That's the fourth kind of temptation. How are you doing? You probably weren't expecting to get this this morning. You were hoping for some other kind of sermon, not an anatomy of temptation in four steps. You're thinking, what is this? What have I walked into? It does get better. <laughs> I hope it does. And I, I wonder if we start with this. This is kind of the turning point. Because I think that this fourth kind of temptation can help us make sense of the other three. And that is the beginning of the good news, I think, in this sermon. Temptation, it is so enticing. But why? Perhaps it's because it uses our genuine needs that need to be met and our wounds that need to be healed and our potential that needs to be fulfilled, realised. And our gifts that need to be expressed. Temptation draws all of that up and then invites us to pursue these things in wrong ways. And when that happens, we end up doing things that are destructive to ourselves and our intimacy with God, destructive to the people around us and destructive to the planet. Perhaps King David needed the love and affection of a spouse, but he pursued this by forcing himself on one of his defenceless subjects, a married woman at that. Perhaps the priest and the Levite in that Good Samaritan story who walked over on the other side of the road, perhaps they were simply just trying to be good religious people. But they went wrong when they chose to do that by prioritising ritual purity over mercy. And perhaps Eichmann simply wanted to be recognised as the master of logistics and transportation that he was. But he transported Jews into concentration camps when others used their gifts to transport them to safety. The Greek word for sin is hamartia, and it means to miss the mark. We might be aiming for the bullseye, but the way we fire can lead us to miss the mark. How about you? When have you been tempted to pursue the right thing in the wrong way? What needs or wounds or potential or gifts do you have? And how can these things, how have these things been taken up into temptations to pursue the right thing the wrong way? I wonder if we need to deconstruct our temptations to playfully ask, what good things am I being tempted to seek in the wrong way? Why am I gossiping about so-and-so? Oh yeah, it's because I have a genuine need for social interaction and I don't know what to talk with, to talk about with my friend. And so we talk about people that we have in common and that we know in common. And I have this need, this deep need to be liked and loved and thought well of. And so I gossip about a particular person so that I look better in front of my friend to see if they side with me, which will boost my feelings of self-worth and confirm that I am indeed loved, liked, right and in alliance with that person. Sound familiar at all? So the temptation to gossip can come from a genuine need for social interaction and a question that at the end of the day we all have. Am I worthy of love? Am I worthy of love? And the question we need to ask ourselves is, will gossip really get me there? Will gossip confirm that, yes, I am worthy of love? Will gossip tell us that we're enough and we have enough? Or is that God's job? I chose temptation to gossip because any other example, and you'd have started running for the fire exits. But every temptation can be deconstructed. And behind each one, there will be genuine needs, wounds, potential and gifts that will be tempted to meet, heal, fulfill and express in destructive ways. 
I hope that in some way that might be helpful. Now here's for the real good news, the real big good news, because we always have to get to that in this church at least. Where's the good news? Because it's all well and good that Jesus didn't succumb to temptation and found that yes, God was enough in the wilderness. But what good is that for us? What is concrete? What is concrete and is helpful in a concrete way today? I wonder if there's something we might have missed from this text that we need to focus in on. You might have noticed that Jesus uses words of scripture to counter the voice of temptation. Man shall not live on bread alone. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Often people jump straight from that and say, the best way to fight temptation is by quoting from scripture. And I think there's some truth in that and some right in that, but let's not forget that the devil also quotes from scripture, Psalm 91, and that proof texts can be used both to support uh, right things and wrong things, and that's problematic. What we might miss though from this is that these verses all come from the book of Deuteronomy. You might be thinking, due to what? Deuteronomy in the Old Testament of our Bibles, also in the Hebrew Bible. And in Deuteronomy, we hear a particular story. And it's the story of the children of Israel, the Israelites. They're being led out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. And then the people of Israel, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And in the wilderness, they're unfaithful. They make a gold calf and worship it and fail to trust God. Jesus is quoting from the book of the Bible that recounts all of that. Jesus has come through the waters of baptism, much like Israel through the Red Sea, and is now being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, much like Israel's 40 years. And if the link between Jesus and the Israelites is still not clear, Jesus spells it out by quoting, not once, not twice, but three times from the book of Deuteronomy. And the big idea is this, where Israel was unfaithful, Jesus is faithful. Where Israel were unfaithful, Jesus is faithful. Indeed, one might see more links. Where Adam and Eve were unfaithful, Jesus is faithful. Jesus is reliving the story of his ancestors in a new way that is faithful to God. He's reversing the whole story of disobedience. And the theological word, don't go to sleep for this bit because you will understand it. The theological word for this is recapitulation. And it was one of St. Irenaeus's favourite words. He was an early church theologian. Recapitulation means to summarise and then state again. The theologian Thomas Wynandy explains Irenaeus's teaching about recapitulation like this. It's a long quote, but it's good. The son Jesus had to assume into himself to recapitulate the whole of humanity's sinful life and history and transform this life and history of disobedience by his obedience. In so doing, Jesus becomes the new Adam of a new human race that is recreated through the Spirit in his own image and likeness. Irenaeus saw it as significant that Jesus' ancestry in Luke's Gospel is traced all the way back to Adam himself. And the Son of God, in becoming human, passed through all the stages of human growth from infancy to maturity. In recapitulating this human history and life of disobedience in his obedience, he reversed the whole chronicle of disobedience. End quote. And, and the bit that I'll repeat again is that last bit. In recapitulating this human history and life of disobedience in his own obedience, he reversed the whole chronicle of disobedience. Jesus came to deliver us from evil by summarising all that went before in himself and restating it 
in a life of faithfulness to God. Jesus did what we were not able to do. Jesus was faithful in those places where we human beings have been unfaithful. You might look back on your life and consider those places where you did not resist temptation. But that's not the end of the story. Because Jesus has been faithful on your behalf and my behalf and by trusting in him. The faithfulness of his life can redeem the unfaithfulness that is part of your life and part of my life. Jesus delivers us from evil. And not just past evil, but present evil too. The author of the letter to the Hebrews wrote, Because Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So we can deconstruct our temptations, we can reason with ourselves that we're pursuing good things in wrong ways. We might remind ourselves that Jesus has reversed all of our unfaithfulness with his faithfulness. But at the end of the day, when you're in the trenches fighting with temptation, you might just need to call on the brown-eyed Middle Eastern man who's been there. You might need to say, Jesus, deliver me from evil. Jesus, deliver us from evil. It is part of the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? But it gets lost in the Lord's Prayer. It gets lost in the lovely rhythm of the Lord's Prayer. And for that reason, we need to extract it. And I warn you, when it's extracted, it's not lovely. Deliver us from evil. That's not a flowery prayer, is it? (laughs) That's not a pretty prayer. That's not a prayer you'd want to own up to pray. But it's one that might save your life or your career or your professional reputation. It's one that might save your marriage if you're married. It's one that might prevent you from getting mixed up in some stuff that could bring your life crashing to the ground. It's a help prayer, a help prayer. It's a prayer that might prevent greed from eating up your life till there's nothing but the skeleton of wealth. It's a prayer that might save you from any number of deceptive lies that detract from your identity as a beloved child of God. That is who you are, a beloved child of God. It's a prayer that will help you to refuse to walk by on the other side of the road. If David had prayed it, Uriah might have lived. If Eichmann had prayed it, thousands of Jews might have been saved. Deliver us from evil. The Russian people need to pray it. Putin too. The Ukrainian people need to pray in their own way. Zelensky too. Lord have mercy on them. Might you make this help prayer your prayer today? Lord Jesus, deliver me from evil, deliver us from evil. Will you pray this over yourself and your family and your friends and this nation? And will you pray it for those in Ukraine right now? Will you pray it over Europe? Will you pray it over the world? Will you pray it over the climate crisis? Lord Jesus, deliver me from evil. Deliver us from evil. Amen. We're going to sing again in Christ alone. And that theme of being delivered from evil is all through that song.